Well, hello everyone at Dr. Challoner's High School. It is such a joy to join you on your day. I hope everything is going well for you and your families in this strange, unprecedented lockdown time. I'm tucked away actually in our garage, away from all the noise and the hustle and bustle, but it's such an honour to, I hope, encourage you today and share a little bit about my story with you. So rewinding right back to the beginning, I was born and raised in Finland. I actually grew up in Lapland, right in the north of Finland, which was an amazing place to grow up. It was great because we lived just up the road from uh, Santa Claus village, so we got our presents before everyone else, before you, I'm sure. But then um, my mum had enough of the minus 40 winters there, six months of snow, so then we moved to the warmer, sunnier climes of Costa del Slough. You might know it, just up the road in Berkshire. The butterball jokes that I know. Anyway, it was there that I sort of grew up and, you know, always sort of aspired to dream big dreams and have this sort of amazing life, but I wasn't quite sure whether, you know, I would be one of those sort of world changers that, you know, these sort of Greta Thunbergs that we hear about now. But I, I loved school. Um, I went on to university to read media and PR at Sheffield Hallam. And then I landed my dream job at Sky Sports News. And I was living the dream, you know, um, but I'm ashamed to say I lived very much for me, myself and I. It was all about climbing the ladder, having the nice clothes, the nice house, the good looking boyfriend on the arm. And not that there's anything wrong with all this material stuff, but um, I'm ashamed to say it was it was kind of all about me. And then I had these two long term relationships and when I was 27 and that second one broke up for the first time in my life, I was available to be disturbed. I was open to something bigger than my world or this little world that I'd sort of um, grown used to. And one day I went to the cinema and watched the film Taken. Some of you may have seen it. It's quite a scary film. I didn't know what I was going to watch and um, just went along with some friends. And I sat there in horror as I watched Liam Neeson's daughter Taken and sold into sex slavery. I thought it was just a awful Hollywood sort of horror film and left it at that. I was disturbed for a few weeks, but kind of left it there. And then a few months later, I went to this um, a Christian conference. I grew up going to church and um, went to this sort of women's conference and it was there that I learned all about modern day slavery, human trafficking, the buying and selling of human beings. It was this whole conference and I heard this talk specifically and my jaw was on the floor. I thought, you know, William Wilberforce had defeated slavery some 200 years ago and lo and behold, there are 40 million people estimated to be in slavery today. And I thought, if this does go on, surely it's in far away poverty stricken countries of the world. And that is true, whether it's slaves in India or Bangladesh making our clothes or the rugs that we buy from Peter Jones or John Lewis, but actually it's rife and it's on our doorstep right here in the UK. People are being bought and sold like commodities, whether it's the young boy lured here from Vietnam, forced to work 20 hours a day for cannabis cultivation, men and women forced to work in cash only nail bars, or men exploited in cash only car washes, or domestic slaves hidden in homes that we walk by every day, or young girls groomed out of nearby estates sold to countless men for sex. And so I was completely overwhelmed when I learned about slavery. I thought, well, what can little old me do to this overwhelmingly huge injustice? So I guess I looked at what was in my hands. What were my skills? What were my talents? What were my areas of influence? And I love sport. I play sport. I worked in sport for a long time. Sport's a big part of my world, but by no means am I some professional athlete. My best friend and I were running along the Thames and she said her ex-boyfriend had rode the Atlantic, both newly single. Um, I was about 27 years old at this time, about 11, 12 years ago. And, um, and she said to me one day, Julia, I've been thinking, should we row the Atlantic? 
well, with a long story in between, my best friend um, pulled out. She had more common sense than I did. But I thought this is too amazing an opportunity to retrace the transatlantic slave trade route and be a voice, make a big, loud noise about slavery. And so Steph pulled out, but I put together this international crew of girls united to row for freedom from all over the world, from Northern Ireland, from Dubai, from America, from the others of us were from the UK. And we were gunning to be the fastest women ever to row the Atlantic and the first female crew of six, but then that became five. We actually sacked our skipper two days before race day. She was a bit overwhelmed at the task at hand. So as five complete rookies, we, we set off into 3000 miles of unknown. I'd never rowed before, I'd never sailed before. I didn't have a clue how to fundraise and raise awareness, but it's amazing how far passion and sheer hard work and determination will, will take you. So in our complete naivety, we set off um, on our adventure. We, we went out in 30, 40 knots of wind, 50 foot waves the size of houses. We had seasickness so bad, I just wanted to chuck myself frankly into the sharks. All our food was on board. We were completely unassisted and unaided. It was part of this big uh, Talisker Whiskey Atlantic race. Um, and we were the only all female crew gunning for these two world records so we wanted to break sub 50 and everything that could go wrong went wrong everything that could break broke generally in the middle of the night but you know when there's pain with purpose it changes everything often i'd be there at two in the morning being lashed up by the waves it was pitch black physically it was tough rowing 12 hours a day Imagine your whole school sort of summer holiday six week period, just rowing two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off continuously until you made it to the other side. And I'd often be there honestly crying in pain. Physically it was tough, but mentally it was excruciating. And I had to remember why I started. And just a few months before we set off to row the Atlantic, I met the first survivor of human trafficking that I ever met. and. Um, her name was Alejandra and I met her, I had the privilege of meeting her at Heathrow Airport and um, she's from Mexico City and she was lured under the false promise of a job in northern Mexico. She had an education, often those without an education, the poor and the vulnerable, the, those who aren't educated are the most vulnerable and likely to be trafficked, but she had an education. And she just went to the north of the city um, for, for this better job. And it wasn't a legitimate job. And she was broken in, raped repeatedly until she was sort of had to do what her traffickers wanted her to do. And she was passed from brothel to brothel, from man to man, sold like livestock to countless men for years. She told me that she was urinated on and degraded and um, had even scorpions thrown on her to scare her. I mean, this is horrible stuff and I know it's hard to hear, but this is the reality. The average age of a traffic victim is sort of 12, 13 years old, just the age of some of you. And so it made my pain pale into insignificance. I thought, Julia, what's harder? Doing what Alejandra had to do or just enduring another two hours? And it made my pain pale into insignificance. Against all odds, <laughs> after 45 long days, we made it to the other side. We made it to Barbados. And I have to say, I don't think I would change. It's hard to say, um, but I don't think I would change those challenges because you know what? I found somebody inside of me that I didn't know existed. Fortitude, resilience, perseverance. They are characteristics and qualities now that I wouldn't have found if I hadn't gone to those deep, dark places that, that were really tough. There was a boat in our race called Dream It, Do It. And I thought a lot about the name of that boat. It's kind of become my life's motto because you know what? Anybody can dream dreams. That's the easy part. It's important, but it's the easy part. But the actual doing part, there is no secret formula. It's simply grit. It's having this whatever it takes attitude and resolving not to give up. Now, I think so many people fail to reach their full destiny and potential, and they fail to reach the other side because they down tools, they down oars, they give 
up. And I just want to encourage you, whether you're going through, you know, some, some waves of life that might be quite difficult right now, but keep going, find that resilience and that fortitude, and you will make it to the other side. I actually um, wrote a book called Row for Freedom. If you like Bear Grylls, then this is a book for you. I'm not trying to plug it, but I would love you to read it because um, with public victories always come private battles. The moment you step one foot out of the ordinary to do anything extraordinary, there will be setbacks, there will be challenges and life can chuck you know, cruel, unexpected blows. And the very week that I said, yeah, I'm gonna row the Atlantic in my complete naivety, my mum suffered a big mental breakdown because her business failed. And so it was the most stretching time of my life, going to work at four in the morning at Sky, leading this crew of girls and learning to row, learning to fundraise, raising awareness. But it was the most thrilling, stretching, but, but a time of growth. It was incredible. So I would say embrace those sort of storms of life and learn everything that you can along the way. Those growing pains are, will, will bring forth much fruit. One day on the ocean, it was a special day, it was Christmas day. Um, I was, we got our first phone call home and I was streaming, just crying after having spoken to my friends and family. I got back on the oars and was rowing away, gazing a bit more attentively than usual onto the ocean and my eye was drawn to a ray of light shining on something and I looked and literally just six feet away from the boat there was a light blue Bombay Sapphire gin bottle and as I looked a bit closer lo and behold there was a message in the bottle in the middle of the Atlantic. I've often wondered you know but you know I actually just watched and as it disappeared away from view and I've often wondered why didn't I stop and grab that bottle it would have made an amazing to tell you all today but now we'll never know. And you know what, human trafficking is a bit like that bottle that I failed to stop and grab. Once we see it, once we hear about it, and once we're confronted by it, there's an ocean full of reasons why we choose to ignore it. I think I was too slow to react. I was too focused on my rowing. I was scared that I wouldn't be able to swim back to the boat. And I was scared that the girls would think that I was chasing this silly message in a bottle, childish dream. And human trafficking is like that bottle that I failed to grab. Once we see it, hear it, we're confronted by it. There's an ocean full of reasons why we choose to ignore it. We're too slow to react. We're too focused on our comfortable, busy life as normal. And we're certainly too worried about what other people will think about us. And I wanna ask you today, will you be braver than I was? Will you jump out the boat, the proverbial boat? And will you grab that bottle? Will you dream it, but will you actually do it? Whether it's slavery or not, we would love you to, to do something for freedom. I left my 12 year career at Sky Sports and I now work for the most incredible charity called Justice and Care. And we have the honor of rescuing women, men and children from slavery, be it in India, in Bangladesh, in Romania, or right here in the UK, where we've rescued nearly 5,000 women, men and children. The unique thing about justice and care is that we dismantle, we go after these criminal networks and we bring these perpetrators to justice. And everything that we do is to spark international and national systemic change at the highest level. We work with governments, we give them recommendations. We wouldn't have the modern day slavery act that we have here in the UK without the work of our CEO at Justice and Care. So I would just ask you, you know, whether it's to fight for slavery or for environmental uh, issues or for poverty, whatever it is, will you do something and if you do want to support us at justice and care i would love you to go to our website check website check out some of our videos follow us on instagram on twitter on facebook it's amazing when i first learned about slavery i started sort of sharing articles and making a big noise about slavery through social media and it was so powerful people are watching all of our lives and um, by you supporting us today with your, um, who, who knew that, you know, a dress down day would turn into the opposite of you actually wearing your uniforms or wearing fancy dress today. But thank you. I see where 
all every penny of, of our donors money goes to and it is impacting the lives of so many people right here in in the surrounding counties that you live in and also globally and it makes such a difference so thank you for supporting us check out our videos and thank you for supporting freedom and i hope that i can come in in the near future and uh, share a bit more about the story with you have a great day dream it do it